yeah, it was just it was an amazing experience, man. Just to be able to be called like one of the best in the NFL, and then to be able to um, showcase that in a in a Pro Bowl in Hawaii for his last time in Hawaii, it was it was surreal. Latavius Murray is an NFL running back known for his powerful running style and consistency. He was recruited out of upstate New York by UCF in Orlando, where he had a fantastic collegiate career. Latavius was then drafted by the Raiders in 2013, where he quickly earned Pro Bowl honors. After leaving the Raiders, he played for the Vikings, Saints, Ravens, Broncos, and now the Buffalo Bills. Off the field, he is dedicated to community service and youth development, specifically honoring his childhood friend. Today, we discuss his journey to NFL stardom, his faith, and his impact off the field. Today's episode is powered by Eleven Labs. Latavius Murray, you are an unusual guy in so many good ways. You are a Pro Bowl NFL player and have played 11 seasons as a running back. That is unreal. You went back to school and got an MBA in 2020. And while so many couples can barely stand the stress of the NFL, you married your childhood sweetheart and have five kids. Can you tell us the story about your wife? Yeah, so my, uh, me and my wife known each other since I was 12, 13 years old. Um, when I grew up in Syracuse, I would go to Florida to visit my dad in the summers. And that's where we met uh, early on. I was playing Pop, Pop Warner football, actually, at the time when we met. And uh, we, we always stayed connected. And, and it was my fourth, fourth year in the NFL uh, when we reconnected. And, um, you know, from that point on, man, things kind of got moving. and had kids, got married, and, uh, and so, yeah, man, we have a beautiful family, five kids, living in Buffalo right now, and, and, and just blessed. You grew up in Nedro in upstate New York. That means you either grew up in the country or near one of the most dangerous parts of the city of Syracuse. Which were you in? Yeah, we bordered, um, we bordered the Valley area, I think what you're talking about, and even at a point in time, we, uh, we actually lived in the Valley area while our home in Nedro was getting built. And so, um, so we had to commute, uh, from that Valley area. I think that you're talking about, but, um, I mean, we were fortunate enough that we didn't at that time, uh, witness or experience any violence, but as we all know, Syracuse is definitely, you know, uh, can be, can be, um, right. Uh, you know, unfortunately a violent, you know, a, a, a unsafe place for, for kids and people. And so, um, you know, one of the reasons why at least I try to make sure I get back, try to be be present and uh, try to be there for those kids who maybe have to experience some of those things. Did your mom have any rules about where you were allowed to go? Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. But, you know, as kids, right, we always kind of push those limits a little bit. <laughs> so, um, so uh, but no, we had rules, man. My mom had rules just like anybody. But I think I definitely pushed those limits like every other kid. Was your mom strict, Latavius, or no? She was, yeah, she was pretty strict. Yeah, she had, you know, she she was pretty strict, disciplined, and I think a lot of those, though, I think I have, and obviously a lot of those has helped me as well um, sure. at the next level in college and, and just being able to be successful and, um, yeah. When she was, when you were growing up, was she? Did she get more strict as you kind of got to the point where? You know, you started getting recruited and stuff like that. Was she more strict to make sure you didn't get in trouble and mess any of that up? Honestly, I think as I got older, she became less strict. I think, I think it's, the, it's almost like you're, you're earning her trust and mm-hmm. you're doing the right things, right? Um, you have the success, you know, on the field, not only on the field, but even in the classroom. I just kind of, I think I just kind of was growing and maturing. Mm-hmm. And as a parent, I think both of you could agree when you see that, then you're able to, pull back a little bit. Are you going to be like, are you going to be strict like her? Do you think, or are you going to be the fun parent? I think, uh, I think I'm, I think I'm both truly. I think <laughs> I'm both because, um, and I think you have to be, I think I, I want to be balanced in that, but sure. um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I, I get a lot of that fun stuff from, you know, like my dad and he was, you know, he loved music and dancing and, you know, he was, he was a, a jokester, still is. But, uh, and my mom, he was, you know, 
living with her right under her roof. She definitely had rules and everything like that, but she had her fun too. So but I'll, I'll have the best of both worlds. Who got you interested in football? Because I know your first love as a kid was basketball. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, I think I've always, I was always interested in football and, uh, I always liked football. Um, I think the biggest thing, right, is like, man, I saw, I saw, I saw other kids like in third grade had football jerseys on. Like, when you know, when you play, if you played a game on Saturday, you wore your game jersey on Friday. And so like, it was kind of like, man, what's that? Like, I think, I, I think early on, it's like, I wanted to be a part of something bigger than myself. And I think that was it. I think like, man, they're a part of this team. They get to wear jerseys in school. I want to be a part of that. And I think that's where it first started. And then so, um, when I asked my mom to sign up, I'll never forget. I was like, a, like, just, I was, man, I was just anything I could do. Like, please find a way mom, like help. And so, um, fortunate enough that a pop Warner coach was able to help. He could give me rides to school and, and play and I was pretty good. So that helped. And so, uh, yeah, that was it, man. Football, definitely just seeing the other kids and seeing they were a part of something that I wasn't and I wanted to be a part of. What pop Warner team did you play on? Toulon, Toulon Tigers. And uh, Toulon was spelled T O L O O N, and that stood for at the time Tully, uh, Onondaga, Lafayette, um, Onondaga Nation. Um, yeah, and I think maybe uh, a Tisco or you know like something out 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 that way. So it stood for all those you know uh, surrounding areas. Is there anything else that most people don't know about your childhood? I think for a lot of people, they don't know that I was originally born in, in Florida and, and moved to Syracuse when I was three years old. And um, my mom moved out to Camillo's with my grandfather at the time. And that's kind of how I ended up in Syracuse. And so I think a lot of people get confused between my ties to Florida and Syracuse. And so when people ask me where I'm from, I say Syracuse just because I was a three-year-old kid. That's all I knew, right? But I definitely had ties to Florida and family in Florida. And so I want to make sure I clear that up. But I, <laughs> I did have a question for – I want to have a question for you. And, uh, you know, I think finding out your situation and um, being being diagnosed, like, I, I want to know where you're afraid because I'm sure a lot of people out there would be. And, and even for me, the thought of it scares me. So – How did you handle that? Were you afraid? It was my worst nightmare come true. Explain that. I want to know if you, if you. Like you, I was big, strong and physical when I was young. I love spending time with my kids or going hunting, swimming, eating, drinking, laughing with friends, all of it. And one of the scariest parts is that after you get diagnosed the whole time, you know, the end of all those activities is coming. Yeah, man, it's a. Again, I can't even begin to think about like that and and having to go through that. So, um, and just so you know, man, I, a lot of respect for you. Still doing it, uh, still able to uh, communicate, still able to give back and do the things that you do. I'll tell you, you remember, I never forget. I, I want to say you were the first book that we've ever gotten, like especially on the Century. I was in Rockwell Elementary. And uh, I think you either came to the elementary or they just had their books in the library. And so um, you were probably like the first book I've ever received. And then growing up as a kid, it's like, OK, here's a kid from the area and uh, he made it to the NFL. Right. Like that is that's our dream. That's my dream. That's everybody's dream. And then to get a chance to meet you, get a play, chance to play with your son, get the chance to sit in that office right there and and talk to you about the books and I know I had my own desire to write books. And so, um, so it's just been an honor to meet you, man. I'm still a fan and I still really appreciate the impact that you've had on my life. And I just want to say thank you for that. Thank you so much for your kind words. Absolutely. Anytime. I know this next question is a tough one. You lost a friend from your childhood, didn't you? If you don't mind, can you tell us the story behind that? Yeah. So in, uh, 2016, um, a uh, friend of mine, John Diaz, who I went to high school with, I uh, grew up with since since kindergarten. Um, he was hanging out downtown Syracuse the night before Thanksgiving, I mean, a big night that everybody goes and hangs out. And um, he just he got into an altercation with someone else. It escalated, and 
inside the bar and then it escalated outside the bar, started in the bar. And, um, and, um, yeah, as a result, he was, he was shot and killed. And, um, I found this out, uh, the time I was in Oakland, uh, playing with the Raiders. And, uh, it was just obviously devastating news, flip up my life in a, in a major way. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I think at that moment, right, you just realize how uh, precious life is, how short life is. Just, I think you can relate in many ways of it just really shaking up your life and putting things in perspective about what life has to offer and where you need to take it. Davis, was that a was that a motive was that a motivator for you that year, or was it? I hate to say a distraction because it's it's worth every bit of the distraction. But did you use that as fuel? Or did that kind of get in your head and, and make that a, a tough, I guess, end of the season and, and end of that year for you? I know it must have been a lot to go through. Yeah, I think um, I think in many ways uh, at that moment it was uh, it was devastating and, and hard. But I think you know sometimes I even I'm not sure if I grieve at time to grieve. If I'm being honest, you're in a season and it's you, you know you, you you have this thing happen and then you go to a funeral and then. You got to go back to play a game right that next week or next few days. And so you almost don't have time to truly grieve. And so uh, more so it was motivation and uh, to just find purpose, man, truly, right? Life is short. And you, you realize up until that point, like, had you have you been living fully? Have you been cherishing it have you been like appreciating it and I, I think it did that for me 100% because I, I felt I truly started living things purpose more purposeful uh after that happened and and, and the fruits of that have have is you know I can show those that's my kids my wife even even on the field I was able to enjoy football more right so I think the, the fruits of those kind of things me taking that that hard thing into something that's been a blessing so at what point did you realize that you were so special that you would live out your childhood dream of being a professional athlete? Because you know a lot of kids dream about that. Yeah. Um, what point did I know? Um, it, uh, I think it came to me um, sometime in college. And I think like, I think growing up, I wanted to play in the NFL and, and, but you just, you just, it's, it's a why. And so like, okay, uh, I, in order to do that, I have to go to college. And so I was blessed enough, fortunate enough to get a scholarship. And then okay, once you get a scholarship and go to college, there's everybody else that's just like you. And so you get right back to a, almost a humbled, right. Starting point again. And it's like, okay, how do I separate myself within this circle? And because uh, everybody wants to go to, to the NFL, so it wasn't until I think I had success in college to where I thought, um, man, okay, I, I might have a chance to, to you know, to, to play at the next level. Uh, I just think for me, I never I think the reason why I never really thought that early on or young in my my age is because maybe just because of where I was from or what the things like I wasn't used to seeing people make it and play in the NFL or I just didn't really grasp that concept at a young age and so like I said guys like you and um, it was Mike Hart right all these guys then it's just like okay this is something that's really real and something that is possible so thank, thank, thank you for those you followed behind another running back in high school Mike Hart that made it to the NFL but he was not as big or as durable as you you two made coach Cosgrove look like a genius how many state titles did you win between you? So me and Mike, listen, I won zero. Mike won them all. Three state championships Mike had. Um, I was close, close, but I didn't win any. And, and, and I was even motivation, right, coming behind him. There was like a, you have to live up to this. And I still kind of beat myself up about not being able to go in and win it. One, I thought we had a talented team, me, so... Mike has the notch on state championships because <laughs> he got three, three back to back to back. What year were you when they won the last one? Were you a freshman? Or were you on the? I was, um, I was a freshman, freshman, and I didn't. No, no, I was. Uh, I think I was in eighth grade. So you missed the. Oh man, 
was in, uh, when I was a freshman. Um, that was Mike was gone, and I was I think Chris was playing running back a little bit. Uh, Felipe Diaz, Jonathan Diaz, his older brother was on the team, and then I I think I got moved up at the end of the year for a little bit that year, and then sophomore year is when I started playing varsity. Like, fully. yeah. After your standout high school career, you were then recruited by a bunch of schools. You ended up choosing UCF, the University of Central Florida. There you played for our mutual friend, the lighthearted and gentle George O'Leary. Yeah. <laughs> He's never been called lighthearted or gentle. <laughs> Light ever. That's the first time. So, uh, yeah, the lighthearted and gentle coach. Yeah. Um, if he was lighthearted and gentle, I wouldn't be sitting right here talking to him. You wouldn't want, <laughs> I wouldn't be worth an interview. Um, no, he, he, um, no, he was, look, he was every bit of what I felt, you know, I needed and players needed. You know, I think I tell him this all the time, right? Uh, you know, contrary to popular, you know, all, all those things he, he was, but much needed for me as a man to mature, to grow. Uh, mentally tough, like all those things that's helped me in the NFL and after that, like any team, there's nobody that even comes close, right? And so, um, so I'm just super grateful for my time there. Like I think a lot of us are, uh, we take that from our experience at UCF and we were winning, right? So it's not like we were doing things that didn't amount to success on the field and off the field, right? In the classroom, we were winning. On the field, we were winning. So I got a lot of respect for him. He knows this. Uh, I don't care what anybody say. He is uh, one of the best to do it and, and just truly grateful for, for him and what he's meant and the impact he's had on my career. That's our, our mutual kind and lighthearted friend. George gentle. Yeah. Gentle. <laughs> gentle, yeah, that's right. Him, him uh, Coach Ellis and Coach Sinclair at us. We, oh, we were yeah, working. So gentle. So gentle. Yeah. <laughs> Those three guys, I think I had nightmares about those guys. No, but like you said, you you hit it right. You hit the nail on the head. They were they were crazy and they were super intense and everything. But everyone became a better man by playing for them. Troy, you talk about Coach O'Leary all the time. Yeah, I loved Coach O'Leary. I, I learned more from Coach O'Leary um, in that in that one year, or year and a half, whatever I was with him. I learned more from him um, about not just about football, about life. Other than other than my dad. I learned more from him in that year and a half than anybody. I mean, I've never, I say to people, the hardest thing I, I can imagine is would be like the military stuff. And I don't, I don't even want to make that comparison, but outside of the military, I can't imagine anything being harder than the stuff we were doing. <laughs> the, the workouts starting at 6 a.m., not warming up, warm up before if you want to. Be there early, 10 sets of 10 on squat, run around the stadium, sandbags. You know, and it was, but it's like you said, it's, He's done it before and it worked and he won. He went to he went to Georgia Tech and turned the program around. He went to UCF and and took it from, you know, a small not small with a small football school to your last year you guys won the the Fiesta Bowl there. It's so like it worked. But yeah, I love I love Coach O'Leary. I think there's a lot of he gets he he's kind of become controversial with some stuff, but he's really um, if you sit down and talk to him, like there's no one more authentic and he won't pull any punches. Yeah. Yeah. I remember Latavius. I don't know if you, I don't even know if you were, uh, you, there's no way you'd remember this, but we were at practice and it was one of my, one of the first practices and I was throwing this as I, you know, just got, came out of, got a, out of high school. I thought I was on, I mean, I thought I was going to start on day one and play all four years. I was going to, you know, getting ready for the NFL when I was 17. Right. And I show up there and, Obviously, like you said, it's very humbling. Everyone's just so good. Blake Bortles there, Jeff Godfrey was there, um, Tyler Gabbert was there. Like, there's a, just tons of really good quarterbacks. And I'm out throwing the ball. I'm having a good day. And really, like hindsight, Rashad Perriman, he was on the. At that point, when I came in, we were running with the threes, and I just kept throwing in the ball. Him and Speedy were on the, and Rennell Hall, Speedy were on the two edges, and I didn't care what the play was. I was just throwing those. One of those guys, I pick him, and I'd throw in the ball. And everything was going, I looked, I looked like I really knew what I was doing. And then I threw a swing pass and I skipped it. It didn't even go near him. And O'Leary, he looked at me, he said, if I want to pass like that, I'll pull someone off the effing street, get the hell on the bench and took me right out. 
And I remember I was like, uh, my ego, I was like, man, I can't miss a throw. I got all these touchdowns to Brashad. Meanwhile, Brashad and, and you know, Speedy end up going to the NFL. I probably was just throwing ducks up there and they were going and getting them. And then I skipped a pass to the running back and he had me on the bench so fast. I didn't even know what happened. I was on the bench so fast. I was in the back watching. <laughs> I love it, man. I love it. Yeah, bro. He, uh, yeah, see what humble you in the heartbeat. Oh, yeah. Again, bro, that's, that's, it's almost like, um, like, a, like, like father, like, right. Parent, like almost mm -hmm. right. Where it's like, you know, if your mom ever thought you were getting too, uh, you know, too big for your britches, like mm -hmm. you know, they find a way to just reel you right back in, man. That's, that's yeah. when you have those traits, right. As a coach, like you need it and you truly yeah. need it to, to humble you. Um, but, and he, but, but they also hurt. They also yeah, hurt. They hurt. He also too, though, I say this to people like, one on one though, like if you went and saw him, I remember I went to his office and he was he came out from behind his desk and was doing seven step drops and like with the feet and everything that was flying through. I was like, man, this. And he was like, you the way he talked, like he would humble you, but then like when you were one on one, he knew how to give you enough like wind in your sails to pick you back up and get you back on track. Absolutely. And he would never sugarcoat anything too. Absolutely, yeah. Now, now that was the gentle what are you talking about no seriously and and so he had that he had some of that in him where yeah. most people would think he didn't and he does <laughs> he does one-on-one -on -one he does for sure one-on-one -on -one only that's a good segue so you played your freshman year and then in the off season you blew out your acl playing pickup basketball that must have gone over well with coach o'leary <laughs> <laughs> no it, it didn't at all um the whole when I did it, man, in my mind from that moment on, I felt like he was he flashed in my eyes like of oh my goodness. It was the first one I thought about, right? Like, what am I gonna tell this dude? Um, I was thinking of a lie all night. I didn't even I didn't even go to the doctors at a hospital, which looking back at it was just a terrible decision. Probably just fear based, really, because again, I wasn't ready to tell. So I stood up all night in my bed, just in pain, and again staring at the ceiling. Like, man, what am I gonna say? Because I know my knee is, and I know I'm hurting. I know something's wrong, but I gotta, I gotta come up with the right lie first before I can even tell him. <laughs> so, but, uh, but yeah. I, I just, what did you end up telling him? <laughs> what did I say? <laughs> what did I say? Um, <laughs> I can't. At this point, I can't even remember, bro. But uh, I can't even remember. I just waited till the morning, and I, again, I barely slept. And I just, uh, I was just limping over there on one leg, and was like, "Yeah, Mary, like, I just my knees kind of hurting a little bit. I'm not sure really what happened. You know, like, I forget what I said. I forget what I said. But uh, at some point, I just had to be real because when she was like, "Well, yeah, you, you tore your ACL," I was just like, "All right, I can't, I can't, like, not. I gotta tell the truth now." I could hear him, man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I could man. hear him saying, "Oh, you, you tore your ACL in your sleep, you yo yo." You know, he would have called you out right yeah. away. Yeah, not believing that at all. So yeah, I had to, I had to confess when I when I found out how severe it was. I was like, oh, I, gotta, I gotta tell you. And then the first, he wanted to know who. Who are you playing with? I was like, I was by myself. I was by myself. I'm not bringing nobody else down with me. This is, it was me and me only. Is that around the time you were talking about transferring to Syracuse? Yeah, absolutely. At that point, then going through the rehab process. So like, okay, fun and games, you, you, you play in basketball and you get hurt and then you have the surgery. And so going through the rehab process was I just, I was miserable. I think like anybody kind of when you, when something is taken away from you, like there's just that sense of being humbled again. Right. Like, so I had never had a major injury before. So I got, couldn't, I couldn't walk when you, when you, when you're, you know, that independence and all that just kind of goes away. Like I didn't know if I could be the same player, if I could ever play again. Like I was just, I was just struggling mentally. I was missing home and, uh, and so, yeah, I tried to transfer to Syracuse. That didn't go over well because the head coach there knew the head coach back at UCF. And so it was basically kind of like, nah, I think you need to go back to him. You know, okay. <laughs> so Doug Marone was like, well, Larry's a good friend of mine. So that didn't go over too well. So, like, I couldn't I couldn't escape George O'Leary. How about that? That's basically what it <laughs> comes down to. Could not escape him. Looking back at that time with the injury physical therapy and trying to transfer – 
Was this the lowest point of your personal life? 100%. How did you know that? Did I, I, is that somewhere? Because, like, seriously, um, that by far changed me and made me into the man, I would even say the man that I am today. Like, that was the, the lowest of the lowest of being hurt. Uh, I had asked for my release and wanted to transfer. Um, I wasn't healthy, right? I had a major knee injury that I had not yet recovered from. And so recovering from that, I just was unaware about, I was just unaware about my future. So I was just at a really bad point. I just didn't believe that, like, it would even be possible to play again at that level and then let alone my aspirations of being a professional. So, like, Yes, that was that was that was the lowest of the lowest. I tell people that all the time. We touched on this a little bit earlier, but obviously the lowest point in my life was when I was diagnosed with ALS. During that time and since my diagnosis, my Christian faith has given me strength. Have you ever turned to any kind of religion? I'm asking without any judgment, just out of curiosity. I appreciate that, man. Absolutely I have. Um and it's crazy you ask me that at a time right now where I would say my faith is um, at an all-time high in, 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 in Jesus Christ. It really is. Um, um, and so I'm just, uh, I, think, I think the things that's happened to me in my life, when you mentioned you asked me about my best friend that passed away, I actually lost a little, another friend recently. Uh, DJ Hayden, the football player that I played with in Oakland. Um, uh, I, uh, something that tells me that God, like God is not done with me and, and I'm here because he still wants to use me. And uh, I'm sure it's the same for you, right? May, it could have been, maybe it was something else. I don't know. And uh, again, I'm not in your shoes. I'm not going to even compare to what it is like, but God is still using me is what I believe. And that's why I'm still here. That's why they're not here anymore because he still wants to use me and their time was done. And so it's a very hard truth in that. And I, I don't ever even think I've spoken that out loud, but that's what I have to lean on. And I lean on God in, in terms of that and coming to peace with that. Have you always been uh, religious Latavius or was it something that came on kind of later in life? Yeah, I think I've always had that foundation, like through through my mom and and, and family and grandparents. But like mm -hmm. me seeking out the Lord um, has been me, and I think that's that's how it has to be, right? Like uh, as we grow and as we mature and we get older and grow in our faith, it's 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 just Him and I. It's just gonna be Him and I. We're standing there. And, uh, and right now, it's just him and I. So I've been in my word. I think that's the commitment that I made recently, most recently, is, uh, is, is being in this word every day. So I haven't really missed a step in that, in that commitment to my, myself. And I hope I keep it that way because that's the foundation, his word, that book. My dad's going to love that. I know he's working on something. He's happy about that one. I love it. I love it. I tell you what, this is all I can say is that this is God right here. Him asking me that, I'm gonna be honest, because I didn't think he was gonna ask that question. And then, but that's the truthful answer, right? Like, was yeah. I was I even where I was a month ago, where I am today? No. And so, there's a reason why he's asking me that today. You know what I'm saying? And uh, yeah. we just came from a conference. I don't know if you ever heard of PAO. Uh, it's an outreach for athletes. Um, it's amazing, man. And uh, Basically, I think the community there, right? Community is a big thing when it comes to faith. Being around like-minded, everybody pointing in the same direction, like like faith and maintaining faith is a, a community is a big part of that and who you surround yourself and what you surround yourself. And so I went to this conference and a big, like leaving that, man, you're just like on top of the world. And, uh, and for a lot of people, it's a reset. It's a start. It's a and for sure for me, I've been to one previously, but it was a just a completely like reset, walking away from that and much needed. When you say much needed, I'm just just curious. I know it's a really personal thing, but how do you? In what ways do you feel like you lean on on your know, religion? Yeah, um, I think I think uh, I think a lot of times we we try to, uh, or at least for me, I think. Just not leaning on again, like on my my own like 
strength. Mm-hmm. Um, just because I just think like life is gonna happen, and 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 like as much as we want to like control it, or we want to like do these things to try to take control over it, like at the end of the day, we truly have to believe it's not our it's not our strength alone. It really is not, and so like. Mm-hmm. I think that's the biggest part is that like you just can't do it alone and you can't do it without God and everything that I have is because of God. Like and so I think it's just that realization, like right, that nothing nothing has happened to me or like without him. Everything that I have is because of him. So like it has to go through him, like life itself. The the good, the bad, all those things it have to go through him. And so I think that's the realization that I've had, like more so than anything. It's when things are good, give him praise, right? I wouldn't have it without him. When things are bad, still give him praise because he's the only source of strength that can get you out. Really. I'm glad to hear you say that you are a follower of Jesus. In today's society, people don't hesitate to say Jesus Christ is a curse. But when people say Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior outside of church, everyone gets uncomfortable. Yeah, they definitely do. And I think, um, I think I could say the same, like growing up, um, uh, there was just, there's just a disconnect in, 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 in what we were taught, what we should have been taught, right? There should be comfortable, you know, it should be comfort in saying that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. There should be, um, there should be, we weren't taught that Jesus loved us, right? That God loves us. We were taught that it was, you're going to hell if you do this or that, or don't do this or that, right? Like we weren't taught his love first I feel personally me growing up I was taught out of fear I was taught that if I didn't do certain things I was going to hell that's just what I thought as a kid right I didn't think initially or the first thing I ever heard was not that hey God loves you and he has a plan for your life didn't hear that first right I just thought that I had to do certain things or else I was going to go to hell so I agree Uh, it should be comfortableness around saying Jesus is my Lord and Savior um And he's mine, so I have comfort in saying it. I love it. So your operation on your knee was a success, and you had a fantastic college career. Despite that, you still didn't get invited to the NFL Combine. That was a blow, I'm sure. But when UCF had their pro day, and for people that don't know, that's when the school invites the NFL scouts to the campus to test players that didn't get invited to the Combine to see if any of them jump out. And you jumped. Literally, I was so impressed with your numbers that they stuck in my mind. A 36-inch vertical jump, 22 reps of 225 pounds on the bench press, and a 4.38-second 40-yard dash. That is flying. Tell us about draft day. Who were you with, and how did you feel? So amazing, man! It was a it was a dream come true. I was I was I was where it all started essentially in Nedro, New York. Uh, with my mom, my brother, and a friend of mine, Donovan from Florida, um, it was uh, it was just a dream come true, man. And, like it was a surreal moment, um, special day. Like my life almost right, it changes like in an instant, and uh, really hasn't been the same since that day, right? But like um, just just you know the journey, right? All you could th- you could think about the journey and, and everything that went into that moment and what you did to get there. And then I was also just excited, man, excited for where, um, where that opportunity could take me in it. And it's obviously it's taken me far and I'm just, just grateful. Did you know you were going to run that fast? No, I didn't, man. I'm going to be, I'm going to be honest. Like I was training really hard though. Like, so, so like, I didn't know I was going to run that fast, but I, but we were putting in work and I, and I was maybe in the best shape again once again maybe ever and be only because like we talked about college being in shape and all that for the combine we added in like the diet part and i had mother when you talk about like combining those two that was a dangerous combination and so uh yeah so when we ran man i was like and i, I now that was the most nervous i've ever been but then you just kind of just man take a deep breath and let it go and and when I ran my first one, I think somebody had off to the, cause there's people in there watching off to the side. And, uh, somebody was like, ah, oh, I think you, you had four, four. And I was like, what? Like, 
even even a four. Like, think about this now. Lying. I'm, I'm 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 hoping I get a four or five, right? Like, I'm just like, hey, hit four or five, and I think you're solid. Just you're good, right? So they said four or four. I said no way, right? So I'm like, oh, okay, all right. I gotta play it off. Like, I'm like, all right, expecting it. Like, because like, like, if that was a four or four, I, I did at that point, and I think I could run a little smoother. So for that next one, I was like, man, let me. Let me just relax a little bit and try to open up a little more, right? And then I, I didn't get that number right after I think, but yeah, when they said four three eight, I said, "Oh man, that's just, this is it couldn't have been any better." Like, <laughs> my day, my day was made. It was absolutely made. Yeah. That that number too. People like everybody watches the combine every year, so they're so desensitized to the number. When people hear four nine, they think it's slow. Four nine is fast. Like compared to the average person watching, if you're running a four or five, you are flying. Four or four, it's ridiculous. Anything below a four or four, and it's like it's hard to even understand. <laughs> it's hard to even understand how fast. Like unless you see it in person, you see it every day. But I'm saying for like the average person who's whether listening or someone who watches the combine every year, if you see somebody who can run that fast, run in person, I mean, it is different. Did you see that Xavier Worthy? You see that four two one? Yeah, and I was gonna say that's. I think that's the problem now. Like you said, whereas we're looking at who breaks that, which is ridiculous, right? Who breaks yeah. that record? Who breaks now? Who becomes the fastest in the combine? Whereas, like, like you're saying, four two, four threes, four you, any of that, like you're flying. Like forget it. You're yeah. Like you're. You're an elite runner. So I was so like that. That was, I'm going to be honest. I was like, the, I think that was the reason why I was drafted. Like, because I didn't get a combine invite. And, um, and so I was kind of overlooked. And so it, it, since those numbers, like he said, jumped out right now. Okay. Okay. Who is this guy? Like and that, that helped. So you're a sixth round pick. That means there's no guarantee on making the team, but they did put you on injured reserve. Were you really hurt or were they just hiding you away? What was that first year on the Raiders like? No, I was, I had to get uh, a scope on my ankle. And so I was really hurt. Now, could I have tried to come back and play? That's one thing. But, but ultimately, no, because I end up, end up coming back and trying and then, and then end up needing to get a, um, a further procedure done, um, you know, not long after that. So, um, I had an ankle, uh, like ligament, just twisting the ankle so much, like early on in my like playing career to basketball, that it was just like real loose and unstable. So I had to get a ligament repair, and then um, so sitting out that first year was I, it helped because I was able to grow, sit back, and kind of get used to like being around the NFL. And then and I was kind of ready to hit it hard, hit the ground running when uh, that second year. Then your second year, you basically explode onto the scene. You play in 15 games and your average yards per carry is a stunning 5.2. In your head, were you thinking, okay, now I got this? Yeah, I think, um, I think, uh, yeah, like I was eager to play. I was behind uh, some veterans and um, I was just, I was just a young back man, ready to play, ready to, I was just running downhill. I just knew, I knew like, like run hard and just run downhill. Like that was the difference I think I brought. And like, we weren't really great as a team, but I just tried to bring energy in that way. So like it was run hard, run downhill, don't waste any time, any movement. And then that also kind of became more of my game and style too, like in the NFL, like just a downhill runner, you know, don't mess around, don't dance. And, uh, and yeah, definitely was, was able to provide a spark like that, that second, that second year. Year three, you are the Raiders featured back. You started every game, rushed for over 1,000 yards, and ended up in Hawaii in the NFL Pro Bowl. Was that the highlight of your professional career? There you go. He, know, he, he knows the lowest, and he knows, like, the highest. <laughs> yeah, that was – that was um, – yeah, man, it was uh, a full circle, like, maybe call it even moment, right? Like, even, even like you mentioned, like, the lowest point in my life and to and – to, I can able to bring that in full circle and say, man, here, I've made it to like, if one of the highest levels in the pro career 
And uh, I, I brought my mom and brother along for that experience in Hawaii. Um, yeah, it was just, it was an amazing experience, man, just to be able to be called like one of the best in the NFL and then to be able to um, showcase that in a, in a Pro Bowl in Hawaii for his last time in Hawaii. It was, it was surreal. What was the best part of the Pro Bowl? Or, or maybe most memorable part? Um, Most memorable, again, I think just, again, the experience itself for the weekend of having, or the week having my mom, uh, my brother there with me, right? These are, like, we, we grew up together, right? My mom raised me, like, the fact that she could, I can experience that with, with them, it was mm-hmm. special, uh, like, throughout the whole week, for one. It was a beautiful resort. It's Hawaii. Um, but uh, I think riding into the stadium too, though, like just seeing the stadium at the white, like seeing all the fans, the different jerseys, because it's the Pro Bowl, so it's all kind of jerseys out there. Um, pulling up to that, it's just like, man, you know, you're not pulling up to a game, yeah, you know, you're pulling up to like an all-star game, and, yeah. and 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 I'm one of them, so it felt really good. Was there anybody on your team at the game that you're like, I can't believe I'm, I'm teammates with X? At the time, yeah, it was. I think like like. Russell, I think Russell might have won recently won Super Bowl or so Russell was there. Um Julio Jones, um Todd Gurley, I was a fan of and we're friends now. So yeah, it was Adrian Peterson was on the other team, but just even being in in that in that atmosphere sure. and across the field from him, uh somebody that I had looked up to as a running back. Um yeah, it was it was, it was definitely one of the best highlights of my career. When I was playing, people used to say the NFL stands for not for long. This brings us to the next phase in your career. You play one more season with the Raiders, and then that next offseason, the Minnesota Vikings offered you a better contract in free agency. That was the contract where you got your first big NFL payday, right? Yeah, the Vikings, uh, the Vikings came with some money, and I had to... You know, you have to solidify that first contract, man. Obviously, you want to you wanna stay on a, a team as long as you can, but financial security, man, is, is I think it's important for players, um, especially that first one, um, you know, and, uh, and I was definitely able to do that. I was able to have a great career. I also was able to come close to winning a Super Bowl. We lost in the NFC Championship, so... Um, Minnesota was was a, a great experience, great organization, and um, great time for me. I started my family out there, and uh, so uh, a lot of love for Minnesota. After Minnesota, you enter a bit of a journeyman phase where you play for the New Orleans Saints, Denver Broncos, Baltimore Ravens, and last season, the Buffalo Bills. What's that been like for you? Um, I think I've taken the experience – which for the good, it has brought me to experience new cities. Um, all my kids, all of them, even my daughter, we, they're all born in different cities. Um, and so I think that's a, a cool part of my, my journey, right? They've been able to experience that with me. And uh, so, um, yeah, I think I, I've been able to experience new organizations, new cities, and um and it's been fun. I think it's kind of been fun for me, man, that I've been able to experience all these things and, and still at a high level. Has there been one uh, team that was the most fun or your favorite favorite team to be on? Or maybe you can't say. I think they're all different, but I would say like top to bottom combination of winning and me successful, like success as a player, winning as a team, culture, coach, like I would say New Orleans, top to bottom city. I think New Orleans, I would have to say as the combination as a whole. Yeah. As Falcons guys over here, it's, it hurts a little bit to hear you say that, but I don't know. Sorry, I mean, if, if I played <laughs> for you guys, I could even <laughs> consider it, but, but is that the best? Uh, is that the best fan base too? When you were playing there, New Orleans. Yeah. No, the Raiders were the Raiders. Were, the Raiders were next level. Yeah. Yeah, the Raiders were next level. Yeah. And the Bills too are pretty nuts. Yeah, the Bills. Yeah, that's true too. I can't. Yeah, the Bills are legit. 
Actually, yeah, the Bills, the Raiders, I played for four years, so the Bills, but the Bills might be up there too. I got to Love to see after this year. There after you your next year, you'll have to, you'll have to, we'll have to yeah. get back with you and check in. Yes. We went to a Bills game when I was young. I was wearing a, a Mike Vick jersey. And my dad was like, hey, I, I don't think you want to wear that going into the stadium. Wait till we're in there and then pull it out. And I had the, I wore it in. I was, I don't know, I was eight, 10, something like that. My older brother is four years older. So he was whatever, 12 or 14. And he was wearing Falcon stuff too. <clears throat> and we were walking with my dad in and then he was talking to somebody on the phone and we were kind of, we were very close to him, but off to the side a little bit. And people started heckling us, a, a eight-year-old and 12-year-old and people were <laughs> We're letting us have it. <laughs> no, no remorse. No, it was great. No, the Bills, the Bills fans have been dedicated for a long time. The Bills, I mean, the Raiders fans too, are also known for being crazy in a good way. I love it. Not a lot of guys go back to school while still playing. Personally, that's one of the things I was always really proud of doing. What made you go back to school for your MBA? Did something inspire you? Um, I had surgery a second time on my ankle um, and uh, it was a second surgery on the ankle. Like I said, in college, you, you, you tear your ACL and you, you're not sure if you're going to recover and things like that. And so um, when I had the second surgery on my ankle, I just got, I just thought about like, okay, what if this was it? What if I wasn't able to come back and play again? And, and what would life look like for me after that, right? Like, what did I have to lean on? I think so much of my experience at UCF, I got a degree, but I think football was number one at that point. And, uh, and so I just wanted to go back to school for something I was really interested in, business, and, and do something for me and, and have a fallback plan and, and so that's what prompted me to kind of go back to school in my NBA. You have a few sons. Would you let them play football? I definitely would. It's, um, I'll leave it up to them. I wouldn't force my kids to play any sport for that matter. I think, I think what I really want to do is introduce them to kind of like all sports, all things, and uh, just let them have a variety and, 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 and let them choose. I don't, I don't have no preference, man. I think what's most important is loving them, supporting them, and, and being there for them. One thing about your career is that you've been incredibly durable. Being a running back and still playing at your level this long is unique. What's been your secret? Um, <laughs> can't let them out, right? It wouldn't be. No. Uh, <laughs> man, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed. Look, I'm blessed. You know, like, let's just start there, honestly. My dad and mom, they... They have incredible genes. My mom still looks like my sister. Um, you know, my dad, he was, he was, a, he was a star himself, a stud. And, um, so I was blessed to have great genes. And then I just try to take care of my body. And I, that's, that's one thing I stayed in the, I stayed in the tubs, uh, uh, during the season, especially I'm just trying to be aware of what I eat and the sleep is crucial. And so I think just the combination of those things, man, recovery, sleep, you know, eating, at least, you know, watching it, especially during the, during the season, during the week, leading up to the games. And, uh, yeah, and it's paid dividends. You, you, you probably won't remember this, <laughs> Latavius, but when we were in college, you said you didn't really know till later on in college if you go to the NFL. When I got there, I mean, we all knew. You, you acted like you were a pro then. Like you would always be – you were always doing extra rehab stuff. You're always in the tubs. You're always doing the extra stretching, all that kind of stuff. And I remember not, I mean, a lot of people, a lot of people would do extra stuff, but you were, it felt like, like we used to say amongst like the freshmen, we used to be like, oh yeah, he's already acting like he's in the NFL. Not in a bad way. Like you literally, we were like, oh yeah, it was like a for sure thing in our, in all of our eyes. Like, yeah, he's, he's, he'll play in the pros. You know, so it's like, you've always kind of taken care of yourself and, and uh, always had that extra edge of like, you know, I guess durability as my dad put it, but you were always like, took good care of yourself. Appreciate it. Yeah, it, it's funny you say that, but I guess when you were a freshman, I was yeah, your senior year, right? Um, yeah, and so or junior. It's funny to say it because I don't think it was until like you probably saw like I guess maybe that start of that. I'm gonna be real because um um I, yeah, I, just, I don't know where I even got that from, but I was trying to like 
finish in the training room a little bit, like do like prehab mm-hmm. as opposed to rehab or whatever like that. So, mm-hmm. But I appreciate that. All I, I just thought I knew like I had to like try to do something for my body to be able to bounce back for practice and uh, and stay fresh. Yeah, so it was your red shirt, red shirt junior year. Okay, yeah. So yeah, that's yeah. Yeah. How many more seasons do you think you have in you? Um, you know, I think, man, honestly, I wanna wanna give it one more chance at a Super Bowl ring, and uh, and I would think that 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 that's it. I would think that I can I can rest assured that I I went out. Um, before I became uh, washed up, you know, um, I think I can say that uh, I gave everything I got. And so uh, mentally, I want to play one more year and chase another ring. And so right now, that's 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 what I'm comfortable with, knowing that I can I can I can give my all to that and put my all into doing that. And beyond that, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't I think I think that would be it. You mentioned uh, earlier some of the favorite teams you were on. How about any any teammates you had that really stood out and and played a big role in your career, or maybe off the field too, as a person? Yeah, um, Lee Smith uh, for the Oakland Raiders, Marcel Reese, Darren McFadden, Maurice Jones, Drew, um, Rodney Hudson. Yeah, these were these guys were a big part of uh early, you know, my, my early on in my career and uh kind of just showing me the way, man, and, and speaking like, you know, speaking life into the ins and out of maybe what was to come and, and what I was going through at that time. That's awesome that they kind of helped pull you along rather than, I know NFL, it's a competitive business. It's great that they tried to pull you along rather than try to, you know, hold their spots or keep you out of the way. You know what I mean? Latavius Murray, it has been such a pleasure. Good luck this season. And when you do decide to hang up the cleats, come talk to us and let's find a way to work together. Thank you for joining us today, my friend. I appreciate you guys, man. Latavius. I got to cut you off though, before you go, before we wrap up, I ask everybody at the end, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I'm late to the game again, but one of the goals of this podcast is it's not an ALS podcast, it's not a disability podcast. It's just interesting people with interesting stories. And, um, so I ask you, who's somebody that you know, that you think would have a, a great story that we should tell, or maybe a story that people have already heard, but you think would be a great person we should talk to on the podcast. Mm-mm. I'm putting you on the spot. Sure. Um, I don't know why this name came to me, but I just think of local guys there. But um, so before, like Mike, I heard of a guy, and even in between Tim Green, I heard of a guy named Dorsey Levens, right? A running back that went to Nottingham. So I don't know too much. I don't know too much about his story, but it'd be good to hear something a little more personal from him right about his growing up in Syracuse he's a Super Bowl champion right went to Georgia Tech and so he's got my vote because I would like to listen on and hear a little more about his his journey as a guy that maybe has been haven't been too much talked about right because it was back in the day right before social media and all that but I always knew of that name growing up and he played running back and he was a Super Bowl champ and so Syracuse legend, Dorsey Levins. I That's a good one. Cool. That's a good one. Well, thanks, Latavius. Like my dad said, thanks so much for uh, for making the time too. I know you're. I know you got a lot going on, and and uh, you got a big big family now too, and and you got the season. Well, I guess you're in the off season now, but I know you got a lot of stuff going on. So, thanks for jumping on with us. Appreciate y'all, man. Anytime. Have good, a good, one. good luck next season. First of all, this is my voice. I'm Tim Green, and I have ALS. This podcast is not about ALS or living with disabilities. I don't want you to feel sorry for me. I don't feel sorry for me. I am a father of five with a marriage that's lasted for over 33 years. I am a number one New York Times best-selling author of 41 books, an NFL first-round pick with an eight-year career. 
I worked on TV for Fox Sports, Good Morning America, Court TV, and Extra. I've hosted BattleBots, A Current Affair, and Find My Family. And I am also a practicing attorney. In this podcast, we're diving into real-life stories. From triumphs to trials, we'll explore the extraordinary in the ordinary. Join me, Tim Green, and my son Troy each week for real conversations, laughter, and insights. Because life is a journey, and everyone's got a story. Barkley Damon LLP is proud to be the law firm sponsor of Tim Green's podcast, Nothing Left Unsaid. For more on Barkley Damon's team of nearly 300 attorneys with regional, national, and global reach from our offices across the Northeastern U.S., Washington, D.C., and Toronto, go to BarkleyDamon.com. I want to thank my partners at Barkley Damon for supporting this podcast and, of course, Eleven Labs for their incredible technology. If you like today's episode, a free way to support the podcast is to subscribe and share it with friends. Thank you. A significant amount of these sponsorships go to TackleALS.com for cutting-edge ALS research at Massachusetts General Hospital. If you want to make a contribution, go to TackleALS.com.